Thank you to everyone for joining us. We'll get started in just a couple moments. Good morning. My name is David Springer, and I'm the interim dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And it is my honor to welcome you to today's event honoring the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. The partnership between President Johnson and Martin Luther King Jr. on civil rights is one of the most productive and consequential in American history. They built an America that was more equal and freer than the one they were born into. President Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and in 1970, he built a school of public affairs to inspire thinkers and doers to call out wrong and fight for justice. And today, the LBJ School is proud to reflect on the past and future of civil rights with contemporary scholars of race and democracy and leaders in higher education. I want to thank today's speakers and each of you for joining us. I also wanna to thank today's event partners, which include the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the LBJ School, the LBJ Foundation, Houston Tillotson University, and Book People, which has signed copies of the Sword and the Shield available for purchase. Now I'd like to turn it over to LBJ School student, Barbara Kufiaden, who will introduce today's speakers. Barbara, thanks for joining us. Good morning. My name is Barbara Kusiadin, and I am an LBJ master's student and a graduate research assistant for the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. My research area is diversity, equity, and inclusion in the practice of both the public and the private sectors. I have conducted field research and student advocacy in these areas and plan to pursue a career where I can harness my passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion to foster more opportunities, healthy work and life experiences, and bring awareness to the injustice and struggles of marginalized communities. Today's speakers will be discussing Dr. Peniel Joseph's critically acclaimed dual biography, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Named the Time 100 Most Read Book of 2020, one of the Financial Times Best Books of 2020, Politics and TLS Books of the Year, of the year and among the Penn America Awards longest, long list, this book upholds longstanding preconceptions to transform our, our understanding of the 20th century's most iconic leaders. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, let me introduce you to today's moderator. Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett. Dr. Pierce Burnett is the first female president of Houston Tillotson University, a historically black college and Austin's first institu institution of higher learning. Dr. Burnett is a strong prominent, it's a strong prominent of historically black colleges and universities in the civic and community engagement. She is a laser focus on finding resources to support and to support a student-centered university. Dr. Peniel Joseph is the author of The Sword and the Shield, 
as well as a historian and professor of public affairs and the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas at Austin. His career focuses on how his career focus has been on Black power studies, which encompasses interdisciplinary fields such as Africana studies, law and society, women and ethnic studies, and political science. He is a frequent commenter on these issues of race, democracy, and civil rights. Please use the Q&A feature to submit questions for the, today's speakers. Dr. Joseph and Dr. Pierce Barnett, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Well, I've been excited about this ever since Victoria called me um, to facilitate this conversation. I feel like I'm having like coffee with my friend, um, not moderating a panel. It makes, it makes me sad that we can't be in person and we don't have people you know, getting their autographed copy of the book. So I'm gonna start off by promoting the book. Um, it's a major part of my library and everybody interested in this topic and others should have it in their library, The Sword and the Shield. So it's so beautiful to see you, Dr. Joseph. Um, I'm so proud of you. Um, you're a scholar, a gentleman, brilliant, bright, and representing all of us very well across the international stage. I'm sure this is a very busy day for you. So I'm excited to be here with you. So I'm, I'm gonna jump right in. Oh, are you on mute, sir? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Burnett. It's an honor to, to be with you and it's a privilege to have you uh, you know, just leading this conversation. So it, it, it definitely, and everybody on the call should know, uh, Dr. Burnett is, is, you know, one of the major thought leaders for just social justice and trying to build the beloved community right here in Austin in the state of Texas and nationally. So we're privileged to have her. Oh, so thank you. Time. Thank you. Um, don't make me weepy at the beginning <laughs> of the call. So. <laughs> so there's a scene in the book, well, there's in history where the two, actually meet for the only time. I don't think people realize that they actually saw each other in person this one time. So uh, from the book, one can gather that their understanding of each other evolves from like what they read in the newspaper or what they see on TV, as opposed to human interaction. And also um, they had very common heroes um, and I would call them surrogates actually, James Farmer, James Baldwin, um, Bayard Rustin, you know, the list goes on. Stokely Carmichael, the list goes on. So talk about that evolution of how they came to understand each other so that we can start that context of their relationship to each other. Yeah, uh, Dr. Burnett, it, you know, they, I think Malcolm and Martin start off as um, adversaries who become rivals, who become each other's alter egos, both in life and then in death. And I think it's really interesting that you talked about reading about each other from newspapers, because initially that's all they have to go on, right? But they become, they, they come to share some surrogates. Clarence Jones, who's Dr. King's attorney, is also a friend of Malcolm X. Okay. Uh, they both know Fannie Lou Hamer, for instance, who's the civil rights activist, who's former sharecropper, becomes one of the leading organizers in Mississippi. And, and really a hero of American democracy in the 1960s. So they come to share people, you know, they, they, they share these different uh, women and men who are part of the movement, who they both come to know and hear about each other in better terms than just the newspaper terms. So I think Malcolm and King initially get each other, e each other wrong. King thinks Malcolm is part of a group that just sort of has a wrong headed version of racial justice, the nation of Islam. Are they reverse racists? Do they hate white people? They're calling white people devils. Like what's going on there? So King says immediately after Malcolm comes out uh, in the national stage that, hey, black supremacy is bad as white supremacy. That's a misreading of the nation of Islam, but it's understandable. And then Malcolm misreads King. He looks at King, he's like, is this person an Uncle Tom? Is this person somehow being used by white people as a safe alternative to this bigger revolution uh, in Harlem and throughout the United States, but also in Africa and the third world that's happening? So initially they think each, they both think the other sort of has the wrong perspective on how to get to racial justice. That's interesting. King, We, I think we've idolized him in history as the dream and Malcolm as the, the the nightmare. I've heard you say that before in times that I've heard you spoke. 
uh, speak. And I think that really we need to understand they're very complex people. I mean, just the images that we have of them, they're very complex people. They were very human and also very young. Um, Hugely young, uh, Dr. Burnett. And you know, what's interesting is the things that allow them to start seeing each other through new eyes are actually historical circumstances, right? They both come to see each other as the times evolve. So as the 1950s progress into the 1960s, King becomes a much more radical figure, even though he's always committed to nonviolence. So King starts to become much more critical of, say, the Kennedy administration and racism in the Kennedy administration to the president's face and to the attorney general's face. He's much more critical. Malcolm, in turn, starts to gain newfound respect for King's organizing and mobilizing abilities. Malcolm starts to really, and Malcolm gains more respect for King through students, including students like John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, who Malcolm meets in Kenya. Uh, Malcolm meets the young activists who are part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but I always call them SNCC because that's what they call themselves, yeah. SNCC. Sometimes I'll have students who say, was it the SNC professor? No, they call themselves <laughs> SNCC. So the NAACP calls itself the NAACP, but SNCC called itself SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And once Malcolm sees those students at the sit-ins who are getting, um, it, it, in a benign way, at best, flower poured over their heads. At worst, they're getting kicked and punched and then arrested, even though they're the ones who are brutalized. He says, OK, I admire these students, even though I disagree with their tactics. And he starts to see that Martin Luther King Jr., who those students loved, like John Lewis, mm -hmm. might be the real deal. And remember, even though they only meet once on March 26, 1964, Malcolm is so impressed with Dr. King throughout 1964 that in December of 1964, Ma Malcolm goes to Harlem, December 17th, and listens next to Andrew Young, next to Andrew, and Andy Young talks about this. He's in the audience in Harlem, 8,000 people are there, including Governor Nelson Rockefeller, and he listens to Dr. King do an entire speech after winning the Nobel Prize, and he tells his own people in Harlem publicly, a few days later, he's impressed with the speech. He's impressed with. So there comes to be an understanding where they see it's not about demonizing each other. The notion of King radical black citizenship and Malcolm's radical black dignity, you need both if we're ever going to get that freedom and that equality and that liberation. Right. There's all kinds of forms of activism. And one of the things I always encourage people is to find your form of act activism. So when we talk about your finding your form of activism, they both had very different childhoods. And I'm a, a strong believer that you, we do become a product of our environment. So can you share with our audience um, their childhoods? You, you, you start with Malcolm Little um, and then talk about his childhood, which I learned. And I, I watched the autobiography and everything, but you can, there's so much to learn. So can you talk a little bit about how their childhoods were different but how they really were the same in many ways, even though their upbringing was different. No, absolutely. Malcolm Little, who becomes Malcolm X, is born uh, on May 19th, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. And his parents are political organizers. Uh, Louise Norton Little is from Grenada. Malcolm's mother could pass for white. She was half Scottish and, 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 and half black. Um, uh, Malcolm's father, uh, Earl Little, um, was both an itinerant Baptist preacher, but they were both, his parents were supporters of Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association was a group that is really the first black power group. It's a group committed to self-determination for black women and men. And when we think about Malcolm's family, they were farmers, but his father was also an organizer and his father is going to be killed and, and Malcolm's always going to say and believe that white supremacists killed his father. We have a new biography that's come out that says his father was killed uh, in a streetcar accident. But the family had been menaced by the Klan. They had been forced to move from Omaha, Nebraska, and later uh, parts of Wisconsin to Michigan because the family was interesting. Malcolm's family always tried to racially integrate all white areas of the Midwest. So they were ahead of their time, Dr. Burnett. They would come to white places and people were like, 
what? <laughs> what? <Are> you? <laughs> you know, and they would buy a farm. <laughs> they would settle in. They sent Malcolm to 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 white, predominantly white schools, and and his brothers, his his brothers and sisters. So it's it seven, and so they were trailblazers. Um, but they were also they were also poor, especially after his father's death. Um, so Malcolm experiences a lot of upheaval. There's a point where his mother uh, uh, is uh, placed in a psychiatric facility. She's placed in, in, in a psychiatric institution uh, for most of his adult life. Malcolm is a foster care child. Uh, he's brilliant in school and becomes voted class president. But attending these predominantly all white schools, he's also marginalized and he becomes what we might think of as a street kid. He becomes at the age of 12, 13, he's, he's hustling and going to school. Before he was Detroit Red, he was East Lansing Red in East Lansing, Michigan. So Malcolm really, I always say, he identifies with the lower frequencies of black life in American democracy because his mother is institutionalized, his father is killed when he's six years old. Uh, he goes to these predominantly white schools, but he experiences uh, not just racial segregation, they call him racial slurs. And he says in his autobiography and even in other writings that the white people who were calling him racial slurs and white classmates, they felt that they liked him and they didn't think it was a big deal calling him these racial slurs that were very hurtful. So he grew up in that Midwest where it's the opposite of what we might think of as a woke American Midwest, right? This is a Midwest where they're calling Malcolm racial slurs and also thinking, well, he's a friend of theirs, right? Um, whereas King, you know, King is, is uh, the, the, the son of Sweet Auburn Avenue Atlanta. He's the son of what we might call a black petty bourgeoisie, a black upper middle class, black elite. Uh, he's he's his his mother and father, especially on his mother's side. Uh, he's from um, um, very very uh, uh, well-to-do black people generationally. His father's side of people were sharecroppers. Uh, so we think about um, Alberta and and Martin Luther uh, King Sr. And when you think about the young King. Both Malcolm and King experience racism in different ways, right? Uh, King experiences racism through, he's a student at Morehouse College and a high school student. He has to ride on a bus for hours because of racial segregation on buses. And he says it's the angriest he ever was in his life because he had just won an oratory contest and was on this bus to a rural part of Georgia. And he had to ride standing up for an hour and a half. And he's livid. And he said at that point, he hated white people until he changes as a teenager and joins these interracial groups in Atlanta that are trying to end Jim Crow segregation. And he says, well, white people are not the problem. It's white supremacy, it's white racism. Mm -hmm. One interesting anecdote about both of their childhoods, they both have an interesting relationship with the 1939 movie, Gone with the Wind. Uh, King is 10 years old when that comes out. And he's aghast when Atlanta has this big premiere for the movie Gone with the Wind. And for those who don't remember, uh, who are younger, Gone with the Wind is a 1939 film that's considered a classic and the biggest box office blockbuster of the era. And it's really um, a, a movie that, that uh, sentimentalizes racial slavery. It, it, you know, the, 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 the Southerners who own uh, enslaved Black people, and it's Clark Gable, uh, as Rhett Butler and Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara. They treat their darkies well, they love their mammies. And it's really these evil white Northerners that upset the whole uh, great society that we had with mint juleps and lemonade and, and black folks were treated so well. And it's the, conf the, the war was bad, the civil war to free the, the enslaved people. That's the evil because the society was so good. So there are a bunch of black stereotypes. Uh, Hattie McDaniel, who's a brilliant actor, she wins an Oscar for playing Mammy. Butterfly McQueen is getting slapped in the face by Vivian Leigh. And Malcolm X remembers watching that at 14. And he says when Butterfly McQueen went into his act, went, went, to, went into her act, he felt like crawling under the rug in, in Mason, Michigan. So they're both, both King and Malcolm are humiliated by Gone with the Wind. And it's one of their seminal memories. They both can't get it out of their minds. It's extraordinary, right? But whereas King has an economic basis, he goes to Morehouse College and um, you know, Dr. Burnett is ahead of one of the best uh, 
you know, HBCUs in the country, and certainly Morehouse is one of the best HBCUs in the country then and now, very elite. He graduates from Morehouse College at 19. Mm -hmm. He goes to Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania. And then he goes to Boston University and gets a PhD by the time he's 26. Right. While King is getting his PhD and while King is in, um, really while King is in college and then at Crozier Theological Seminary, Malcolm X is in prison for almost seven years because Malcolm's very rough early childhood translates into him moving to Boston to be with his older sister, his older half sister. And he really starts becoming a part of the underground economy. He starts to become somebody who sells weed uh, to jazz players, somebody who gets involved in illicit activities. He's going to be arrested uh, for being part of a burglary ring and really gets sentenced to 11 years because it's an interracial burglary ring. Malcolm Little, uh, his girlfriend at the time is, is, is white and he's going to be uh, sentenced to three different prisons in Massachusetts and it's in prison that he's gonna find himself. It's in prison that he gets introduced through his uh, siblings, the Nation of Islam, and he uses the Nation of Islam as a vehicle to leverage the intellect and the genius and the talent that he had in service of a larger project than, than, than himself. And that's what King does too. Both of them are very selfless political leaders who are thinking more about the larger context of black humanity than their own self aggrandizement. Um, the, um, the, my mother and I went to see Gone with the Wind a couple years ago and we left uh, in the first scene, the first couple scenes because, um, and when you tie that together about their perception and it does make you who you become and you look back and you think, wow, that's why history will repeat itself if we don't understand it and we don't study it. So speaking of that, we are repeating some history right now which is very sad time in our in our in our our, our nation and in, in the world really and birmingham radicalized everywhere everyone even uh president kennedy at the mm -hmm. time so it, he said and i'm quoting civil rights movement and racial justice should be at the center it's the beating heart of american democracy and that was a message that dr king um and Malcolm X to some respect have been really driving home. So if you could maybe in your thoughts, your reflection, how do you see this repeating itself right now with our own government and the political actions that each of them took? Even though um, Malcolm X wasn't known to be a civil rights advocate, he was at the, the if, I'm, if I'm right, if I remember the book correctly, he was there in support of while, the, while they were filibustering, if you will. So, oh yeah, he's at the March on Washington as well. He's at the US Senate filibustering. He's at a bunch of demonstrations. You know, Dr. Burnett, I would say that Malcolm X was both a civil rights and black power activist. Um, you know, the journalists, whenever he's at demonstrations, they ask him, well, what are you doing here? Because the Nation of Islam, you're not supposed to be a part of it. Malcolm shrewdly replies, he's there as an observer, Dr. Burnett, but he's not, he's a participant. He's an active citizen. So he's a, he's a very, very shrewd in, in, right. in that sense. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the times that we live in now are very interesting because both Malcolm and Martin wanted us to confront uh, America's original sin of racial slavery and the way in which racial slavery produced this supply chain of power and privilege for some and misery and grief for others, right? And I think that um, Malcolm and King often in their speeches, I think one of the most fascinating parts of the research was how much they talked about American history and how much they talked about slavery. Malcolm early on and King, especially the last three years of his life. And so I think that history is a history that is still confronting us. You know, when we think about there are positives that are confronting us and negatives, you know, a, a positive of trying to overcome that history was just January 5th and what happened in Georgia. And, you know, Stacey Abrams is a proud LBJ school alum. And I think when you think about black women organizing historically, going back to the 18th and 19th centuries uh, and black feminists organizing, Martha Jones has a great book called Vanguard about black women and the, 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 the you know, voting rights for, for, for all women and, and the suffrage movement, but centering them. And so when we think about what's going on in Georgia, the positive legacy 
was Reverend, Reverend Raphael Warnock, who actually presides over Dr. King's former pulpit and pastorate at Ebenezer Baptist Church. So what's so extraordinary about Georgia, when we think about the positives of this history, is Georgia was an effort to confront the, the living ghost of America's past, the ghost of America's first reconstruction, but also the second reconstruction as well. When we think about the civil rights movement as America's second reconstruction to literally and figuratively uh, reimagine American democracy, we went from not having any voting rights in Georgia to Dr. King as a teenager writing about black men being murdered for trying to vote in the state of Georgia and writing uh, uh, columns at Morehouse about this um, to electing Reverend Raphael Warnock as the first black senator from the state of Georgia uh, alongside with John Ossoff and Warnock helped Ossoff who's 33 year old Jewish American candidate. And we've resuscitated that black Jewish alliance in Georgia doing that, right? But it starts with the work of Stacey Abrams and all these, these black women, uh, Carol Anderson, who's an academic and activist, uh, the WNBA players who very courageously uh, wore the elect Warnock t-shirts in defiance of their own co-owner, right? Um, so that Georgia is an example of confronting the ghosts of the Confederacy, the ghost of white supremacy, the ghosts of not just uh, uh, lynching, but Robert Smalls, who is an African-American Civil War uh, soldier and politician estimated over 50,000 black people died between 1865 and 1900 uh, in efforts to restore white supremacy in the South. And so Georgia is a positive example. So, uh, uh, so before we even get to negatives, I'll say Georgia is extraordinary. Dr. King at his I Have a Dream speech, a March on Washington, he talks about the the infamy of Stone Mountain, Georgia. Stone Mountain, Georgia is a national embarrassment even now because it's, a, it's, a, it's monuments dedicated to white supremacy um, and, a, and an exemplar of the resuscitated Ku Klux Klan in 1915, right? We, there's, there's no part of the United States that should have that. We think, but, but Dr. King says at the I Have a Dream speech that, that freedom's gonna come to Stone Mountain, Georgia, right? So in a way, Raphael Warnock and, and Ossoff in January 5th was freedom coming to Stone Mountain, Georgia, and King's prediction comes through. He doesn't live to see it, and he had talked about that April 3rd, 1968, that he had seen the promised land, uh, and we had difficult days ahead, and he said, I may not get there with you, but together we as a people, we shall, we shall see and achieve that promised land. So we, we have to hold Georgia uh, deep, deep in our hearts alongside of this past presidential election, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think the negative side of that history and not confronting it is the assault against American democracy um, at, the, at the Capitol the day after the warnock Ossoff victory. And I think that we, we have to be willing, like Dr. King, to speak truth to power and say, it's a white supremacist riot at the nation's capital that was trying to continue the long history of disfranchising black voters and being opposed to black citizenship and dignity because what they wanted was to make sure atlanta voters didn't count detroit voters didn't count milwaukee voters didn't count in any state that the biden harris ticket won because of a majority of black voters who, were, who, who had their own freedom dreams, right? Who wanted to count, who, who felt that Black Lives Mattered alongside of white allies and other voters. They wanted to say those Black voters committed fraud. And they are not the first people to say that. They said it in the 1960s and 50s, even before the passage of Voting Rights Act. And they said it during Reconstruction. And the violence that we saw at the Capitol, we saw that violence throughout Reconstruction, probably one of the most notable um, and I know, Dr. Burnett, you know about this incident, is Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, where the duly elected interracial government is sacked mm -hmm. and folks are killed and murdered. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why North Carolina reconstruction ends and oh. the last black Congress person uh, from the South is George C. White. And he makes that famous 1901 address to Congress called A Negro's Farewell to Congress. We don't get a black person uh, elected in the House of Representatives from the South until 1970. And, and certainly Barbara Jordan uh, becomes one in 1972 after the 72 election. 
So th that's the histories we're trying to confront. And Malcolm and Martin, they knew about that history. And right now, I argue, we're really uh, living through America's third reconstruction. And really the first, second, and third are all intertwined. And unless we're able to face that, we're not ever gonna be able to move forward. And we have to face it both together as a nation, but we have to face it in all these thousands of towns and villages and municipalities, including Austin, where we have our own history. We have our own very, very hard history. And what we've done is try to ignore it. And then we wonder why it keeps resurfacing and bubbling up. Just like a sore until you it's really a wound that never heals. And it's a wound that, like Malcolm X said, we don't acknowledge. Malcolm said, you can't put a knife in a person's back nine inches and remove it right. three inches and call that progress. He says, you haven't even removed the wound. You're not, you haven't removed the knife and you're not acknowledging the wound. And that was that's what we've done with racism. Every time we get those three inches out, and remember, some of that might be spectacular. Michelle Obama, Barack Obama. Um, um, you know, uh, presidents and thought leaders of universities like yourself. I think it's a spectacular and it is removing the knife a bit, but we act as if we're all good now. Right. <laughs> we're all good. I, before I ask my next question, I want to say one thing that I did take from the book is Malcolm X's sense of humor. I don't yes. remember that from the movie, maybe because I was just too enthralled with Denzel Washington, but um, I just don't remember that, that level of his humor. Um, dry in some cases, but you really do a, a masterful job across the board, but just bring them out as people, as humans. There's you, a great new movie, Dr. Burnett, called One Night in Miami that I just yes, watched yes, and directed by Regina yes. King. I cried at that movie. Phenomenal. Uh, because phenomenal. Uh, we're, we're experiencing some of the same things now, but I thought Kingsley Ben Adair's uh, Malcolm X was wonderful. I thought all of them. It's uh, it's it's Malcolm X, Cassius Clay before he's Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and yeah. Sam Cooke. Yeah. Uh, the the night of February twenty eighth, maybe nineteen sixty four, after Cassius Clay awesome. wins the heavyweight championship. And and what's interesting about Malcolm, people, um, and now we're getting better examples of this. And I try to do in the Sword and Shield. Malcolm X is a three dimensional human being who loves his wife, who loves his children. You know, um, four, four daughters when he's alive, his twins are born, born posthumously. Uh, so six children, six daughters, right, who, who are all brilliant. Um, he, he is super funny and has a sense of humor. Malcolm taps into black trauma, pain, but also joy and resilience. So yeah. we, we don't, we don't want to, I mean, he, 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 he loves us. He loves our food. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Malcolm can dance and was a, a big time dancer <laughs> in Boston and Harlem. <laughs> Yeah, just he's got. They, they called him Rhythm Red because Malcolm is the redhead with the with the light eyes and and the freckles, and we come in all kinds of shades, as we yeah. know. We come in a thousand shades, right? Yes. I thought it was important for us to understand that this is somebody who loved his family, who cared about people, who is unbelievably funny. We all want to be around people who make us laugh, who is really witty and intelligent and curious. So he he's this super extraordinary figure, and we we pigeonhole Mal Malcolm whether we're black or white or anything in between when we set him up as just this avenging angel and warrior yeah because exactly. none of us are just one thing none yeah. of us right none so he's, us. he's he's this beautiful soul and i wanted to get that out and certainly dr king is as well but but Ma Ma malcolm is 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 incredibly funny as part of his legacy that just that was a that was probably one of my favorite takeaways from the movie is just all the different facets that you bring out of them they're so they're so they're complicated humans and um, and brilliant men in their own right. Uh, that movie One Night in Miami, art imitates life, life imitates art. We don't, which one is it? Um, it's just those types of movies to tell our history from so many different angles. And there were so many um, iconic individuals. So I want to have one more question before we open two more questions before we open it up to the audience. But I have to give a shout out, you know, I'm the president of the historically black college, I just love them. I, you know, I didn't attend it. I've dedicated my personal life to them. I just see we created all these icons, a majority of the civil rights activists um, during the 60s were, um, or in some cases are HBCU graduates, Warnock, ironically, is a Morehouse graduate. And um, um, and and Stacey Abrams, uh, even in addition to LBJ, is a, a Spelman company. They're sister, brother, sister institutions. So I'm just super proud of them because we've been the bastions of um, creating these intellects, if you will, that have this fearlessness in who they are. 
So I, I want to unpack. Well, Kamala little Harris little. is a Howard University hey, graduate. Harris My older a, brother is a Howard University graduate. So I, I love HBCU. The HBC. president, the president of, in, you know, I mean, the president, the mayor in Atlanta, just uh, so you go on and on and on. Lance Bottoms, absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Um, so you talked a little, you touched a little bit about women. Um, Fanny, Fanny, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So one would, they're often the hidden figures, just to use that term. So just a few minutes, spend a little bit of time about the women and the role that they played in the um, um, activism of each of these giants. Oh, no, absolutely. I think that, um, in fact, I'm working on a, a book right now that really fleshes that out and, 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 and looks at uh, women in this time and, and, and you know, the second and the first reconstruction alongside of these other figures. Um, you know, both one, Malcolm and Martin uh, are born into this patriarchal society. And so they have an evolution, but they're not intersectionalist vis-a-vis -vis identity justice as they are about the intersectionality of issues. Malcolm comes further than, than, than Dr. King, I would argue, through his visits to Africa, where he sees that African revolutionaries are women and men. And he says in his last interview that's published that um, the best societies are treating Black women and men equally, right? And in his final organization, Organization of African-American Unity, he's got Lynn Shiflet and Black women who are in charge and right there. Um, one of his big advisors is Maya Angelou and Betty Shabazz. So Malcolm comes, um, he evolves from the real sexism of the Nation of Islam, but also just the United States of America. Yeah. I think King has a, a, a tougher time. The woman who's going to have the biggest impact on King's life besides his mother is Coretta Scott King, who's really an intellectual and an activist and an organizer uh, in, her own, in her own right. Um, so, so one of the things we see with, with Black women, both during the period of Reconstruction, during the Civil Rights Movement's heroic period, and then I'll contrast it with today, is that they are leading um, organizers who, because of uh, the patriarchy of the time, um, are not given the credit uh, and the access to power that is deserving of their labor. A great example is going to be Rosa Parks and Jean Theo Harris has the brilliant biography of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks had been an activist in her own right for over a decade. Right. And she had been active against the sexual assault and rape of black women. Mm -hmm. uh, a great book on that uh, is, is The Dark End of the Street um, um, uh, by Danielle McGuire as well. Um, and, and when we think about Rosa Parks, she's not just some, she was 42, she's a young woman. She's not this little old lady who was a seamstress who decided to not to uh, give hair it, pulled you know, back. Right. And so mm -hmm. Dr. King is more of a mobilizer than an organizer. And, and Black women are not allowed to really give a full speech at the March on Washington. Rosa Parks is introduced, as is Gloria Richardson, and as is um, Lena Horne. Uh, but that's because of the patriarchy uh, of the time. And so when we think about Black women organizing, both in the church during the 19th century and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham has righteous discontent. Uh, we're thinking about um, black feminists like Mariah Stewart and Frances Harper and Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper, uh, Nanny Helen Barrows, um, black club women who are connecting um, racial justice to ending patriarchy and wanting the right to vote in the 19th century alongside of, of white suffragists. Um, what we're seeing is that they are still uh, fighting what Fran Beale calls double jeopardy, being Black and being a woman, and also being in a tough position of trying to figure out how can they connect both? And if they're anti-racist, does that mean they have to stop being anti-sexist? And how can they push back against conceptions of liberation that are based on a patriarchal vision of liberation, right? And I think that What's so extraordinary about 2020 and 2021, and really this third reconstruction, has been the impact of Black women who are Black feminist activists. They're building on the legacy of these previous generations, people like Audre Lorde and Barbara Smith, but the Tamika Mallory's, the Patrice Cullors, uh, the No Names, um, you know, uh, uh, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, Brittany Packnett, some of them have come to UT's campus. But they've organized not just as a hashtag Black Lives Matter, but chapters and dream defenders and um, you know all these different 
organizations that are at the grassroots to think about justice intersection. So this is where I write in the epilogue to Sword and the Shield that they've amplified uh, the work of Malcolm and Martin because Malcolm and Martin talked about intersectional issues but they didn't think about identity. And we've seen it with the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Burnett. It impacted all of us, but the dot, dot, dot is differently. So our identity matters. If you're HIV positive, if you're trans, if you're mental, mentally uh, uh, ill or non able-bodied or differently able, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you're a woman, if you're gay or straight or queer, if you have wealth, if you have networks and a family, that can help you when you're unemployed. All of it matters. So when people try to smear identity politics as not universal, identity politics is the only politics that's universal right. because it's based on the realities that we actually exist. We are not all cisgender. We are we not all men. We're not all white. We're not all one thing. So the only way you can um, have equity, true equity, right, uh, on the way to equality is to understand that we're all starting at different places. And that's what black women have always done very, very brilliantly. And I thought this year, when you see how many black women are front and center, right? Uh, instead of, um, you know, uh, brothers yeah, pushing their way into the photo, right. Right. In the center, the center, uh, it's been really great to see. And I think that that has added to uh, a much more holistic conception of what do we mean by citizenship and dignity and freedom and democracy. Yeah. So one final uh, question, and then we'll move to the audience's q and I encourage everyone to put your questions in the Q&A section. Um, I want to give a shout out to Nanny Helen Burroughs. My children actually went to Nanny Helen Burroughs Ele um, Elementary School in the Washington, D.C. area. And it's just and so I studied her just a, a force, a powerhouse. Absolutely. Uh, yes. and an educator. So an educator. Mary Church Terrell. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, Nanny Helen Burr, goes on and on. Mary yeah. Branch, which is the first yeah. female of this. Of, um, I'm the first female of the combined institutions, but Mary Branch, she was a bad sister. And I think of what she was up against without the internet. When I have my woes, I say, look, I have a picture of her in my office to remind me of just the, the forces that they sailed through. Janetta uh, Cole, the whole deal. The whole deal. Um, so in my last question, uh, the beloved community is for all. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe that Martin Luther King was when he talked about the beloved community. It's all the, what you just said. He may not have had that in his mind, but in the divine world for me, beloved is for all. So you seem hopeful like I do. I have great hope. Yes. And what would be your call to action for the everyday citizen? you know, not the Martin Luther Kings or the Malcolm X's, just the everyday citizen. What is the call to action from you that what people can do in their lives to bend this moral arc towards justice? No, absolutely. Um, thank you, Dr. Burnett. I think it's, we have to educate, organize and agitate those three things. And we start by educating ourselves. We educate our children. Um, we educate the, the, the supply chain of power and privilege and the networks that we have that are connected to our children's schools, that are connected to our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, our nonprofits, um, our community uh, centers, wherever we may be, and educate ourselves about um, American history, you know, African American history, Native American history, all of it. Uh, but I think we have to understand that uh, racial slavery. Um, is not just the original sin, it's the organizing uh, fulcrum of, of, of this society that produced all the great wealth and opportunity that some people have, but it's also produced um, systems of structural violence that we're still trying to confront. And that means all of us um, have a kind of unearned privilege. Sometimes it's male privilege, Sometimes it's racial privilege, it's economic pr privilege, it's gender privilege, sexual orientation privilege, mm -hmm. uh, geographical privilege where you're not living near environmental toxicity. And it means doing the inner work um, to try to recognize that and then respond to that. And the organizing is that you don't have to go to the state house or um, organize a, a policy convention or conference. It's really about your neighborhood and, and what are you seeing in your neighborhood? 
Um, is your neighborhood racially segregated? Is your public school racially segregated? Whether you're in Hyde Park or Terrytown or, or Westlake uh, or East Austin, um, it's thinking about gentrification and, and why does gentrification happen in such an unequal way right here in the city? It's thinking about culture and movies and music uh, and the supply chains that those things produce. It's thinking about uh, the, the neighborhoods we live in Austin and why are they so racially and economically segregated, right? Um, um, is that because some people make better choices than others or is there something embedded uh, deeply unequal in our society? And then finally to agitate, once you know that, to you know, speak truth to power. Um, it's, you know, Dr. King said that vanity asks whether it's uh, popular and the conscience asks whether it's right. Uh, there's always a time to do what's right. Uh, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. I think we all understand that we should be committed to eradicating racism, defeating white supremacy, um, wherever it exists, right? Uh, but a lot of times we shrink from that 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 responsibility and we we look at it as a burden instead. So I think if if we educate, organize, agitate right here in Austin, um, we you know can create the beloved community. We each of us have the capacity to be a ripple of hope here. Uh, the work you're doing at HT, the work we try to do at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Um, and, and those ripples of hope, uh, Bobby Kennedy famously talked about, can really spread out and they create, they can create a wave and tsunamis that can actually transform the world. So I think that we saw it last year, 15 to 26 million people uh, took to the street to say Black Lives Matter uh, in defense of Black dignity and citizenship, largest social movement in American history. We've never seen anything like that. And it's up to us to harness that. We're at another crossroads point. We were after Dr. King's assassination between the beloved community and law and order, and we chose law and order in that 1968 context, which is why we've built up the, the biggest prison nation the world has ever seen. But we can choose the beloved community, uh, but it's gonna take work. It's gonna take work. Um, we can't afford pessimism. We can't afford cynicism, cynicism, but we've got to be realistic. We have to, we have to be willing to speak truth to power because that's what Dr. King did. Dr. King was willing to um, speak out uh, when people were doing wrong, even if that cost him friendships and if it cost him popularity. And we can do no less in our own time. And we all see the crisis that has emerged uh, around us. It, it's hard not to, uh, to, to see the depth and breadth of the issues we're facing. Beautifully said, just absolutely beautifully said. Um, I appreciate that so much. Um, particularly, I want to just amplify the part about self-work because uh, racism is a sin of the heart. And it's really not about bigoted people all the time. It's about systems that we build and continue to encourage. So just, um, and support, unknowingly or knowingly sometimes in our own privilege, it's just beautifully said. There are a lot of questions here and I only have six minutes. So let me just kind of try to, pull out one that um, uh, this is actually very fascinating and it's a question I had. So um, Dr. Muhammad Ali, who said that the rent we pay to live on earth is service. Um, and he had his own form of activism. So the question is, um, Muhammad, we see Muhammad Ali's image behind you. Um, Ali's relationship with Malcolm X is well known, but could you tell us about his relationship with Dr. King or was there any? Yeah, there was a great relationship. Dr. King um, speaks out in support of Muhammad Ali. Ali refuses draft service around February of 1967. Dr. King is speaking out against the war starting in April and at times making public appearances with Muhammad Ali and really, really uh, uh, praises Ali's courage in terms of speaking out against the war uh, in Vietnam. So, you know, Ali obviously is a huge symbol of um, um, courage uh, and, and, and sort of human rights in the 1960s. I think um, he's drawn to Malcolm X, obviously he's part of the Nation of Islam, but he has um, respect for, for Dr. King as well. So yes, they do, they do have a relationship. And those dynamics have come, come out in that movie, um, One Night in Miami, where Malcolm yeah. is vulnerable almost, um, where he's thinking about leaving the nation and you know, just the vulnerability of them, the humanity. Yeah. No, it just yeah. um, the book, the movie copied off of you in pointing that point, <laughs> I might say. Um, one final question um, from the audience was about um, 
Is there any evidence on the part of either person of solidarity with the gay rights movement or any evidence of their discrimination against gays in the 1960s? And I hope you talk a little bit about Bayard, Rustin. Yeah, you know, I would say that, yeah. I mean, I think that they both are not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're conscious homophobes or queer phobes. I think they grow up in a queer phobic society. Um, I think Malcolm X knew his, from his days as a hustler, uh, people who were queer, and, and certainly Bayard Rustin is the openly gay, brilliant organizer of the March on Washington, social democrat, Gandhian nonviolence, just an extraordinary figure who is friends with both of them, you know, and I think I would add their friendship with uh, Bayard, uh, Bayard Rustin and James Baldwin. James Baldwin is also openly queer in, in terms of the movement. And, and uh, Malcolm uh, deeply admires James Baldwin and, and, and so does King. So I do think that um, they didn't think of uh, uh, LGBTQIA rights in the same way we do as part of this intersectional uh, movement for justice, um, but they had good relationships with folks who were, um, who, who were, who were gay. Um, and I, I haven't seen, um, you know, huge amounts of, of uh, homophobia or anything from, from them um, publicly or, or privately. Certainly they weren't at the level of what we would want today, but I think both of them being so intellectually curious and so empathetic uh, personally and individually, the yeah, the humanity in them would have, would have seen, because Malcolm is coming to the point where he could see uh, black feminism and see African uh, feminism and and why that that matters, um, and I think they both would have embraced these these movements. They would not have been um, for marginalizing anybody, which is what being against these movements um, becomes. Becomes. So we have two minutes before Victoria cuts us off. So I'm going to squeeze this one in. Um, it's um, what was the most surprising information that you found out during your research, doing your research for the book. I think the most surprising was when uh, Malcolm uh, sits in next to Andy Young watching Dr. King do the Nobel Prize speech. I couldn't believe it because I hadn't I hadn't found it anywhere. I I I thought they only met March 26, 1964. I I, I found it unbelievable that Malcolm, you know, just sat down next to Andrew Young. Andrew Young is the future Atlanta mayor and and UN ambassador and one of the civil rights luminaries of the 20th century who's been to the LBJ school and really important figure. And, and, you know, Andy Young liked Malcolm X, admired Malcolm X, and they're chatting like old friends next to each other. So I'm like, jaw dropped, <laughs> you know? I'm like, wow. And then, and then Malcolm saying, hey, that speech that Dr. King gave was great. There's another interview Malcolm gives to Robert Penn Warren in 64, where he says him and King um, are after the same goal and the same goal is human dignity. And that was a jaw dropper too. Um, so you just saw the evolution where you saw the deep um, admiration that he had for King in real time. And I just couldn't believe all this evidence for it and that we weren't talking about it. You know, we, so again, it's like um, you can actually write, you know, the movie script. It's not fan fiction to have a movie and see Malcolm X that night where he's watching King December 17th yeah. or so, 1964. That actually happened. And so you yeah. can actually have, you can actually do something like One Night in Miami where, where Andy Young and Malcolm yeah. are right there and they're talking about King. Nelson Rockefeller's there. There's mm -hmm. over 8,000 people there. So yeah, that blew my mind. You know, that-, I hope, that art, I hope art imitates life in some way. Um, <laughs> I had the privilege of seeing Andrew Young, of meeting him. And he was talk, doing a presentation and he talked to, he said, that um, there are no coincidences. Coincidences are God's way of remaining. Um, it's, the word is skipping my mind, um, anonymous. There are no coincidences. Coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous. And it is not a coincidence that you were born in this time, in this space, to use your scholarship to shed light on very important people in our history and doing it in a way that's teaching us all, particularly young people. So I'm super proud of you. My hat's off to you. Um, someone should take a screenshot of your bibliography behind you and have every one of those books in their library, but most importantly, to have this book, The Sword and the Shield. No coincidences that you are living in a time such as this in Austin. We're very blessed to have you. 
So thank, thank you so much, Dr. Burnett. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. It's been my honor, and and I feel the same way about all the work that you're doing, and really your leadership and just. Um, trying to move us all towards social justice and building that beloved community right here in Austin. So thank you so much. Bless you. Wow, what an awesome way to start off MLK Day. I wanna thank you both so much for that discussion. It was awesome. Also, thank you so much to everyone who attended today's event yes, on you. The Sword and the Shield. Copies are available for purchase at Book People. You can find the LBJ School on YouTube for on-demand programming like today's events. Also, please join the LBJ Foundation for a new series called The Path to Racial Equity. Dr. Peniel Joseph will speak at their upcoming event on January 21st about the root of racial injustice in our country. And you can learn more about this event at the lbjlibrary.org. Thanks again to the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, the LBJ Foundation, book people in Houston Tillerson University. One last word, educate, agitate, organize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Burnett, definitely.